So I don't have many. Well, that's a lie. I do have many theories about to hell of a start. about sports. Some. I have one theory that I believe applies to this Dan Snyder story, which we talked about briefly with Don Van Natta yesterday. But I wanted to follow up on today, David, because I realized as I was dissecting it piece by piece that this is something that I really wanted to talk to you about. Because my theory about sports and life is centered around incentives. What do people have to gain in any given moment? And so when I look at the knives out murder mystery aspect of who leaked John Gruden's racist homophobic emails, the ones that got him eventually ousted from the NFL, I was thinking about, yes, how in all of this, Demoris Smith, the head of the NFL Players Union, who was racially insulted directly by Gruden, is of course one suspect. Motive. Motive. How Roger Goodell, of course, who hates John Gruden, apparently, and also wants to be tough on racism. Motive. And also keep Demoris Smith around because Demoris Smith, it turns out, is bad at his job. He's the Tony Clark of union leaders. A Love useful him. union antagonist. Motive. And then there's Dan Snyder, who, alongside Rock Nation, Jay-Z's company, and his own law firm, they wanted to both deflect to Bruce Allen that Bruce Allen, the guy Gruden was emailing, was the problem, and also curry favor with Roger Goodell, the man leading, in some sense, (laughs) maybe not enough of a sense, the investigations against Snyder himself. Motive, motive. And so in all of this— That's every part of the equation. It's crazy! And so Don Van Natta and Seth Wickersham do this story in ESPN, and there are theories, and everybody is a plausible suspect, and I think it's so amazingly on the nose when chaos is a ladder in this way, when in this scandal, everyone's seeing— You have to say it in the voice. You have to do a little finger voice. I think only you can do the voice. No, I can't do the voice. You're a voice voice. person. Brock Meyer told me you're like the voice person. You're like the Daniel Davis. is a ladder. There it is. What the Daniel Day-Lewis of, of oh, Metal Arc Media. That was DDL? No, it's Game of Thrones. Little Finger, Game of Thrones. There's some oh, Game of Thrones in this, it. David. Chaos is a ladder. Chaos is a ladder is what I think about when I think about this story. This is a story that starts with money. This is a story that starts with Dan Snyder thinking that there's an investigation going against him that has a chance to rob him of his team. And it's a story that starts with Dan Snyder doing things that should make it so you can't own a team. And that gets lost way too much. All of this started because Dan Snyder is despicable in every way. As a man, as an owner, I don't know him as a father, but as an, at what he did and what he does, that is enough to be sterling. I believe that Dan Snyder, his fatherhood aside, has been investigated by enough levels of our government Federal, local, congressional, the NFL, and all of it is unprecedented. Unprecedented. And he got caught in the same way, a lot of the same way that Sterling got caught, where he thought that he was above the law, quote unquote. And it turns out that when Roger Goodell has your back, you can be above the law. When you lose Roger Goodell and other owners, then you have a problem. Dan Snyder actually believed that there were not 23, 24 owners who would ever force him to sell. That's the number it takes in the NFL is 24. He thought he was Teflon. He also seems to think that uh, because of the blackmail PowerPoint, like all of these people are complicit in bad behavior or running their clubs a certain way. So how, like, I certainly can't get ousted from this when everyone else is doing something, too, which is, to be fair, true of a lot of clubs, but also is not an excuse for, like, criminally bad behavior in some cases where he's being investigated by federal authorities for business practices and sexual harassment cases. And has been personally accused of sex crimes. So the blackmail PowerPoint, we touched on it yesterday. I want to touch on it again for people who may not have been M-A-I-L. Here. Blackmail. I made this mistake yesterday. Yeah. Yeah. No space in between. It's it's a yes. I don't. I actually don't know the etymology of blackmail, but I do know the result of it. It is when you know something and you say, "I'm going to tell someone else what I know," unless you do something for me. 
And Dan Snyder went into an owner's meeting and committed the number one crime you can commit is he made a presentation. Normally, you're on the receiving end of presentations at owner's meetings. This was to Roger Goodell. This was to All the, the owner's executives, yes. everybody. And he puts up emails that he had gotten, that he had found, that put people in a position of saying, uh-oh, I wouldn't want that on the front page of the paper. I wouldn't want people to see what I've written. And what Dan Snyder says, if you don't play ball with me and not release the Beth Wilkinson to say nothing of Mary Jo White, we're talking back the multiple an investigation investigations. Ago. Yes. This is an inception level of investigations. If you do not do what I want, I'm leaking every single one of these. That is great blackmail. And guess what? They said, forget it. We're going to leak first. Everybody it was a race to the leak was leaking. And it's so funny because John Gruden's lawyers are doing their forensic analysis of figuring out who does Dan Snyder like in the media. And he does not like the Washington Post. The Washington Post conspicuously got none of the leaks, but the New York Times did. They found stories that had been written by the reporters in question, apparently, that indicated that, oh, they have a little bit of favorable coverage to Dan Snyder in the past seemed to be corroborating who got certain leaks in this news cycle. We would have a system in place where we had a list of which reporters were friendly to of us as a front office and which were not. And we would give, we would leak to the reporters who would give us positive, and I'm not impugning reporters and their neutrality but at we, all. But, I, but this, this is, is real. Oh, this is what I want to talk to you about, David. It's because behind the curtain of how to run a sports team, behind the curtain of politics in America, leaking and favor trading and access journalism, all of this stuff, as much as we want to be very pure and, and uh, you know, idealistic about even the, the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, on a micro level, these decisions are being made every day. I didn't invent it. I can only tell you that I played within the rules as were presented and taught to me about how you deal with media. And again, now that I'm on the other side, I understand that I'm not impugning the quality of these reporters and what they do. No. But the way you get scoops, do you think all the guys at ESPN making $10 million a year, that there's no quid pro quo for the information they get? Like, are you as Wait, any- who's making $10 million a year? Or is it more? Schefter? Are they, is that, oh, I, I mean, I, maybe if Don's making that much, Don sure Vanetta, Don. Don is underpaid. Not making that much. No, like but I was talking Woj place. and Schefter. I was talking and Shams. That but, the, those okay. people. But to speak broadly about how this all works, if you are hunting a story and you're playing the long game, if there's a bigger game you're playing, it is not uncommon for a reporter to do something in the near term that is small to gain the trust and favor of a source who will then give you something bigger that was worth the earlier squeeze. It's what they do in law enforcement when you try to turn state, have someone turn state's evidence where you use someone to get to someone bigger. Hey, I'll let you off. You did something really wrong, but I won't put you in jail, but you got to tell me who told you to do it. That's very commonly used in our criminal justice system and certainly in our journalistic system. Is that a word? Well, it is in the Wall Street Journal sense here because they are, in fact, the... Again, this is John Gruden's legal team. I want to source this to them. I have not done this analysis, but the point is it is deeply unsurprising that leaks happen to be the knife of choice, that this was how they exerted public pressure that got, in the end, a lot of agenda items checked off the list for all of the people that I started this conversation with. The writer of that story was the babysitter for my daughters in New York when he was a 12-year-old when I would leave the kids to people. Andrew Beaton got this great story. And when you... Look at me, when you get, a weird one. When you get access... Not as weird as my parents are divorced, but also weird. When you get access to a story like this, and the Daniel Snyder story has been feeding the journalistic desires of so many papers for so long, and it's coming to an end, in theory, on July 20th, and then word comes out today that the sale's in jeopardy. Well, that, that begs the question, who do you think benefits from Don and Seth's Steph story coming out on ESPN? Because obviously people that feel inclined to talk to them have a reason for wanting this to come out now. Well, everybody, of course, everybody has 
their own agenda if you're a source, right? It's very rare that a whistleblower is truly motivated by nothing but the pursuit of truth. But we but, pay whistleblowers now, so oh, of course that's and, not and, it. And I think there's an argument for why that should be so. But I believe that even though there is this conflict of interest in every human heart, right? Even if that is so, if you can verify the story, like the idea that the Wall Street Journal should not have published these emails, I'm not saying that. Okay, good. I'm not saying that. I'm saying that there is journalism is a messy thing. Like the idea that you got a scoop from a source who had a motive, and therefore because of that motive you cannot publish that scoop is not what I'm saying. I'm just saying that when we read stories of this magnitude, we should be wondering what do the people leaking have to gain? And if that is okay in the reporter's calculus, then maybe it's okay to publish. But aren't you going with other sources as well? You don't exactly. publish based on one source with an agenda. They had documentation in this case. This is actually based, he actually emailed this. So then it doesn't even matter but, what the. But it matters in the sense that there's a larger story. So the Wall Street Journal is in the, inside the Russian nesting doll of scoops. Don Van Natta and South Wickersham, the bigger container that right. they're now wondering, okay, but why did you get this? Right. And and there's also the aspect of like the newsworthiness of what was in the email, which I think it's incredibly important for players and fans and the league. They probably already did know, but it's important for people to know that there is an active head coach saying these things on totally. the via email. Like that's important. It's to a know. huge story. Everyone should be aware it, it's of fireable. that. Yeah. It's fireable. I mean, so it, and of, it was. Yeah, and all of these things, Jess, are coexisting. But what I'm calling for is just a, a, a realistic understanding of how these things get brokered. Yeah, it was only fireable, just so we can discuss that for a quick moment, once it went public. They knew about it. Of course. And th that's a big difference. So let's not pretend that the NFL or Roger Goodell or Mark Davis or John Gruden, none of this would be going on but for it being made public.